My name is Jake. I grew up with just my mother after my parents divorced when I was young. Mom had a chronic illness, and although she worked, full-time employment was difficult for her due to her condition, so she could only manage a few hours of part-time work. Since there was no child support from my father, we had to live on my mother's salary alone, leading to a very impoverished lifestyle. Yet, I was happy just to be with her. Our meals were modest, especially for a growing boy, but sharing them with her was enjoyable, and we never lacked smiles. Wanting to ease her burden, I decided to start working right after graduating from middle school, despite her objections due to her chronic illness. When mom asked me about high school during exam season, I told her, I'm not going to high school, I'll work. She raised her voice, which was unusual for her. Go to high school, don't worry about the money, she said while crying. Seeing her like that made me waver for a moment, but I said, I'm not that smart, and I think I can be more helpful by working. You've done so much for me, now I want to do my part. I'm like this because of my health, she said, tears streaming down her face. That's not it. I want to work of my own volition. It's not because of your health. Please don't cry. Let's have a happy meal time like we always do, I reassured her. As I headed to the kitchen, I heard her say, Thank you, I'm so proud of you, and I had to hold back my tears. My middle school teacher, Mr. Thompson, opposed the idea of me working right after middle school, saying, Your mother will be saddened. But when I firmly said, I've discussed it with my mother, and she understands, even Mr. Thompson had to relent. Honestly, finding a company that would hire a middle school graduate was challenging. Most companies required at least a college degree, and I couldn't even get an interview. That's when Mr. Thompson said, a company owned by an acquaintance of mine is looking for sales staff. They're interested in interviewing someone with determination, even if they're a middle school graduate. Before he could finish, I blurted out, yes, please, I'll do it. Please arrange the interview. Then, wearing an oversized suit, I went with my mother to the company Mr. Thompson introduced us to. The HR person, seeing how nervous I was, laughed and said, don't be so tense. I've heard about your character from Mr. Thompson. You've got guts and don't get easily discouraged, right? We'd love to have you work for us. And I was immediately offered the job. Turns out, they had never hired a middle school graduate before, but Mr. Thompson had been persuading them for weeks to take an interest in me. Mr. Johnson, the company president, gave the green light, thinking I could bring a new perspective to the company. Mom, listening beside me, tearfully expressed her gratitude over and over. I'll work my hardest. Thank you for this opportunity, I said, standing up and showing respect. The HR team said, the job might be tough, but it's also rewarding. Let's work hard together, and we shook hands. When I called Mr. Thompson to tell him the good news, I could hear him crying over the phone. I almost cried myself, but managed to hold it in. On graduation day, Mr. Thompson said, maybe I shouldn't be doing this for just one student, but don't give up, keep going, and gave me a blue tie and a silver tie pin as a gift. Wearing that gift on my first day at work, I felt like Mr. Thompson was pushing me forward my spine straightening with confidence. Time flew, and it's been five years since I started working at this company. In the beginning, I made mistakes every day, having never done sales or even part-time work before, and got scolded by my manager. But thanks to my colleagues, I became good at teaching others. Being close in age to the new graduates, I was adept at providing empathetic training. My manager noticed and often assigned me to train new employees. In the spring of my sixth year at the company, Mr. Johnson handed over the reins to his daughter. Although he was still young enough to continue, he decided to step down, saying, my ideas and ways of working are outdated. The next generation should shape the future. After retiring, I heard through the grapevine that Mr. Johnson and his wife moved abroad to enjoy a leisurely life. His daughter, Emily, who became the president, 
had previously managed a regional sales office after graduating from college and had rapidly grown its performance. Her motto as president was to provide efficient and accurate services, leveraging her sales expertise. Emily took an interest in me as soon as she came to our company. She was probably just curious about me, being the youngest employee there. Whenever we met at work, she would strike up a conversation, and one day, she said, let's exchange contact information for future purposes, and we did. After that, she would contact me daily. The messages ranged from simple good mornings and good nights to work discussions, but mostly they were just casual chats. Then one day, she said, I've been interested in you since the first time I saw you. Would you like to date me? So, I started dating her. At first, I was skeptical, wondering why Emily would choose me, given the many other potential partners out there. Still, she was incredibly beautiful, and I gradually found myself drawn to her charm. At work, Emily was totally a business person, but with me, she was sweet and affectionate, which made her all the more endearing. I felt privileged that she showed her true self to me. We kept our relationship quiet, known only to a few, and mostly spent time together in my apartment or went out of town. It was like being any other couple, holding hands, enjoying meals together, and spending time at my apartment. This was the first time I truly loved someone other than mom. After a few months of dating Emily, suddenly, she stopped contacting me. At work, she wouldn't even greet me, seemingly avoiding me. One day, I saw her confronting a superior, asking, why did you hire a middle school graduate right in front of me? Looking back, her behavior had changed since she met my mother. Emily had insisted on meeting mom, and although I thought it was too early for such things, I agreed. We had reserved a restaurant near my family home, and initially, the mood was pleasant as we enjoyed our meal and conversation. However, I remember how Emily became noticeably less talkative after mom mentioned. He started working right after graduating from middle school to support me. On the way back, we hardly spoke, thinking she was feeling unwell. I suggested, should we just go back to your place today? Normally, she would insist on staying longer with me, but this time, she simply agreed, okay, and left in a hurry. Reflecting back, even when I offered to take her home because I was worried, she just said, it's okay, and left as if she was escaping. Now I realize that Emily changed her attitude after learning I was a middle school graduate. From that day on, she frequently visited the sales department, watching the employees as if monitoring them. If she knew I was around, she would make snide remarks like, the presence of a middle school graduate even dulls the atmosphere. About a week later, I was called to the president's office. Why are your sales so poor compared to others? Interrogated like this by Emily, I began to explain, I've been focusing on training new recruits, but she cut me off and said, it's impossible for a middle school graduate like you to train new people. If you have time for such meaningless tasks, focus on your own work. You can only teach newcomers if you are competent yourself. Understand, you need to meet this quota by next month. Hearing this, I was speechless as I looked at the document she handed me. It was filled with sales targets that even the top performers had never achieved before. That's impossible in a month, I protested. If you have time to train newcomers, you should be able to do it right, Emily said with a sly smile. That day, after work, I felt like my spirit was completely broken. My colleagues tried to encourage me, and my manager, who knew the situation, said he would talk to Emily on my behalf, but having lost all my energy, I submitted my resignation to her the very next day. As expected, this is the fate of an incompetent middle school graduate, she said, and I left her office, trying not to cry. As I was gathering my things to leave the company, my manager stopped me. Sorry I couldn't do anything for you, he apologized repeatedly. And then he said this. He asked Emily why she was so insistent on making me resign, 
because he was not satisfied with her attitude towards me. She was initially reluctant to speak, but opened up after he threatened to report the matter to the former president. She had once been in a serious relationship with someone she considered marrying, but they drifted apart due to her busy work schedule and eventual infidelity, leading to a breakup. That past love had been a middle school graduate. Despite having worked hard in school, attending good high schools and universities, and dating men with educational backgrounds, she felt deeply hurt and betrayed by that relationship, leading her to distrust people with a middle school education. Since I was a middle school graduate, she saw me as the same type as her former lover. To her, I was an enemy. Hearing this, I felt a twinge of sympathy. Emily might have lost a significant part of her life to a grand romance, but I was different from her past lover. The idea that one bad experience could lead someone to label all middle school graduates as unworthy or to think they all behave the same way seemed rather unfortunate to me. A year has passed since then. I switched jobs to a company introduced to me by a friend. When I decided to leave my previous job and when my new job was confirmed, I informed Mr. Thompson, my former teacher. When I quit, he offered me words of encouragement over the phone, though I could hear the sadness in his voice. But when I told him about my new job, he was overjoyed and even sent me a navy blue tie to mark my new beginning. I couldn't bring myself to tell mom the truth, so I lied and said I was headhunted. She probably knew I was lying but didn't ask any questions. On the first day at my new job, she cooked a special meal and made sandwiches for me. Actually, I was introduced to about three companies by my friend. All of them had good conditions and were willing to hire me despite my middle school education. Among them, I was particularly impressed by Mr. Carter of the company I ended up joining. I met Mr. Carter at a cafe on the day of our interview, which was arranged by my friend. We arrived at the cafe earlier than the scheduled time. Mr. Carter and I had agreed on a meeting time, but even after five minutes past that time, he hadn't arrived. My friend, knowing him to be punctual, worriedly wondered, he's usually right on time. I wonder if something happened and was about to make a call. Just then, an elderly man hurried to our table wiping sweat from his brow and said, I'm so sorry for being late. My friend said, Mr. Carter, we were worried. It's rare for you to be late. Mr. Carter apologized, saying, I'm really sorry. I ran into a bit of trouble on the way here. I'm Brad Carter and handed me his business card. He looked familiar to me and I tried to remember where I had seen him before. While walking to the cafe, I was chatting with my friend. On the way, my friend's phone rang, and as he talked, I walked along, wondering, what kind of person is Mr. Carter? My attention was inexplicably drawn to an elderly man and an old lady at a police station. The elderly man was making eye contact with the old lady, while a police officer nearby was talking to someone on the phone. Shortly after, a family member of the old lady rushed into the station and kept expressing gratitude to the elderly man. I thought maybe he helped the lost old lady, but didn't think much of it at the time. I asked him, were you by any chance at the police station earlier? He replied, yes, I was. An old lady was having trouble finding her way home. I had to meet you guys, but I couldn't just leave her there. Sorry about that, he said, slightly embarrassed. During our conversation, I felt strongly that I wanted to work under him. As our meeting was coming to an end, I eagerly said, I'd like to work for you, Mr. Carter. He laughed like a child and said, you beat me to it. I was planning to scout you myself. Please join us. We need someone like you at our company. And thus, my employment was decided on the spot. Having experience in sales, I quickly became a key player in my new workplace. One day during a break, I checked my phone and saw a massive number of missed calls. I felt a chill as the same number called again. Hesitantly, I answered, hello, it was Emily. I had deleted her number when I left the company and honestly didn't remember it, so I didn't recognize the number. 
It's been a while. Are you doing well? I was waiting for you to contact me, but you didn't, so I called, she said. Continuing, she said in a tone as if expecting a reconciliation. You are so stubborn. I'm not mad anymore. Why don't you come back? I felt cold hearing Emily's voice, talking like an ex-lover wanting to get back together. I've moved on to another company, so I'll be going now, I said, trying to end the call. But Emily interrupted me. Wait a minute. You liked our company and didn't really want to leave, right? I'm not mad anymore, so stop being stubborn and come back, she said. Her tone implied she wouldn't let me hang up until I said, okay, I'll return to the company. As the afternoon work hours were approaching, I became anxious to end the call. The more I hurried, the harder it was to hang up. As I was feeling troubled, Mr. Carter appeared behind me. May I take over for a moment? He asked and started talking to Emily. After a short while, Mr. Carter said to her, Are you looking to rekindle a romantic relationship with him or do you want him back as an employee? It seems like a difficult decision to make between personal and professional matters. Then he continued, It must be tough for you, Ms. Johnson. It seems like you've lost a big fish, both as an employee and a lover. As for our company, we'd prefer not to poach such a valuable asset. Shortly after, the call ended. Mr. Carter, with a smile, said to me, I couldn't just stand by when I sensed something was wrong. Sorry for intruding and invited. I had to give up and hang up because the conversation wasn't going anywhere. But if you get any more calls and find yourself in trouble, let me know. He handed me back my phone with his usual smile. Tears welled up in my eyes and I expressed my gratitude to Mr. Carter, saying, Thank you so much. Mr. Carter, seeing my reaction, said, Protecting our valuable employees is part of my job. Come on, cheer up. How about this? He handed me a soda, presumably bought from a vendor machine. I meant to buy orange juice, but accidentally bought this, he said with a slightly embarrassed smile, and we both burst into laughter. Later, I heard from a former colleague at my previous workplace that Emily continued to neglect personnel development and focus solely on improving sales performance. As a result, newcomers kept quitting shortly after joining. In her personal life, desperate to get married, she apparently hoped to rely on me for both a marriage partner and personnel development. However, she gave up after being directly rejected by Mr. Carter. Emily's company soon went bankrupt, and she ended up single with a huge debt. I thought maybe her father, the former president, would help her, but he had heard about her behavior and my situation, and decided not to tolerate such disrespect, even from his daughter, making her take full responsibility. I would never serve a double purpose for her. I felt that Emily's outcome, focused on efficiency, was self-inflicted. At the same time, I realized that my encounter with Emily led to meeting Mr. Carter and helped me grow as a person. I don't wish to meet her again, but I hope in my heart that she will change her ways, reflect and find a new path. And I aim to be like Mr. Carter, considering others, helping those in trouble or distress, not creating employees who suffer as I did, and nurturing good talents for both the company and society. My name is Jack. I just turned 20 this year. I work for a moving company. I don't have a girlfriend, nor have I ever had one. Moreover, there seems to be no prospect of getting one. I don't have any female acquaintances, and my life is just a back and forth between home and work. While people my age are enjoying university activities or drinking parties, I don't have any of that glamour in my life. I think I'm leading a pretty plain life for my age. But I don't think I can change, nor do I want to. I'm just going to live quietly and end my life alone. That's sort of a resigned feeling I have. Not because I'm predicting my time of death, but because that's how my life has been up to now. I've accepted that this is my fate. 
I was born in a fairly urban city, to parents who were 17 and 18 at the time. Both of my parents were well-known troublemakers locally, and they had what you'd call a shotgun wedding. But my dad cheated when I was two years old, creating a scandal. That ended, my mom filed for divorce, and I was raised alone by her. My mom was rough and had a foul mouth, but she showered me with plenty of love, so I never felt lonely. She worked day shifts at a convenience store and night shifts at a bar, so physically, I was alone a lot, but when she came home from work, she was always smiling and listened to my stories, which made me feel happy. Jack, make sure you study well and go to college. Live wisely, not with the hardships I've had. That had become like a catchphrase for her. As a child, I didn't think about it much. Got it, I always replied. I thought that would make my mom happy. So since elementary school, I prepared and reviewed every day, and my grades were top-notch. Every time I brought home a perfect score, my mom would say, Way to go, Jack, that's amazing, and her hugging me was the best thing. But being poor and a straight-A student, I was an easy target, and I don't have many good memories of school. Called a nerd and excluded from the group, I spent my breaks alone. But honestly, I didn't care. I thought I didn't need friends who would hold me back from studying. But I knew talking about it would worry my mom, so I kept quiet and never said a word. The time I could spend with my busy mom was my reason for living. But then, something happened that plunged me into despair. When I was in fifth grade, I was home alone, waiting for my mom to return, but no matter how long I waited, she didn't come back. The next morning, the doorbell rang. Don't open the door if a stranger comes. My mom always said, so I ignored it. But waiting for her to come back, I thought. Maybe mom lost her keys. Nervously, I opened the door. It was a police officer. I was taken to a hospital. To the morgue, no less. There, my mom was lying still. My only emotional support, my mom, had died in a traffic accident. My heart felt like it was crumbling with a loud clatter. It took a long time to accept reality. But my healing heart didn't wait for those around me. Because my mom ran off with my dad when I was born, she became estranged from her family. There was no relative willing to take in a child like me. My father was nowhere to be found. In the end, I ended up in a foster care facility. The people at the facility were very kind and tried hard to make me feel comfortable, but it was just a nuisance to me at the time. I had never thought of getting along with anyone other than my mom, so I couldn't adapt at all. Even as a middle schooler, I remained quiet, and of course, making friends was out of the question. But out of habit, wanting to make my mom proud, I continued to work hard at my studies and remained at the top of my class. Having moved on from the same elementary school to a local middle school, almost everyone knew about my family situation. The bullies, who had already targeted me, began to harass me even more, using my situation as an excuse. Must be lonely without your beloved mom, huh? You have no friends, so all you do is study, right? Poor thing. Being subjected to such heartless words was an everyday occurrence, and I became numb to whether it was painful or not. Amidst this, there were just two people who spoke to me. One was a guy named Kevin, a classmate since middle school. He was flashy and had lots of friends. It didn't seem like he had any reason to bother me, but there was one thing I suspected. It was the presence of another person who talked to me a girl named Maria, also a classmate from middle school. Maria was what you'd call a person with both beauty and brains. Even I, who had no interest in others, could tell from the atmosphere that she was respected by both boys and girls. I had no acquaintance with Maria. Good morning, Jack. Bye, Jack. Suddenly, she started speaking to me like this one day. There was no malice in her behavior 
but she didn't talk to me beyond that. Just greeting me with a smile every day. Back then, I didn't feel happy or annoyed by it, but now I think those greetings from Maria made me feel like I existed. But let's get back to the point. It seemed that Kevin liked Maria and started bothering me, suspecting something between me and her. Hey, are you close with Maria? Maria's cute, right? I went to the same elementary school as Maria. Kevin always talked about Maria, but unlike the others, he didn't bully me. Not really. Huh? I'd respond like that. Then we reached our third year of middle school. I had been studying for high school entrance exams, thinking it was natural to make my mom happy. But I decided to stop pursuing that path. The facility I was in supported us until high school graduation. Moreover, with my good grades, I could have been recommended to the top local high school. But I couldn't find a reason to stay in the facility and continue going to school. My mom probably thought graduating from a good school and joining a good company would lead to happiness. But I couldn't see any vision of happiness for myself anymore. Since I'd be looked down upon by others and live alone anyway, I might as well truly be alone. I thought it would be easier to earn a modest living without being looked down upon by anyone. Despite persuasion from the facility staff and teachers, I chose not to pursue further education and instead started working at a moving company, where even a middle school graduate could start with part-time work. Soon after, I left the facility and began living alone in a small apartment. The apartment, with no one else there, was more comfortable than I expected. Additionally, the employees at the moving company, who were very fond of me as a teenager, helped me become more accustomed to interacting with others over a few years. As an adult, I didn't face any unreasonable bullying, so on the surface, I think I became a normal working adult. But I always thought the deep-seated wariness of others in my heart would never go away. I was promoted to a full-time employee at the moving company when I turned 18 and was leading an ordinary life. Recently, as I was approaching 21, I stopped by a convenience store after finishing a job a little far away. Hey, isn't that Jack? That's what a guy around my age said to me. Who are you? I didn't hesitate to ask. Man, that's harsh. It's me, Kevin. We went to middle school together. For a moment, I genuinely couldn't remember, but hearing middle school reminded me of the one guy I could think of. He was about the only guy who ever talked to me. Ah, but even so, I had nothing to talk about with him upon this reunion. While I was struggling to respond, Kevin continued. Long time no see, huh? How have you been? Starting such a harmless conversation. If there's nothing much to talk about, he doesn't need to bother talking to me. Just as I thought about leaving. Do you have a girlfriend now? He asked. Finding this bothersome, I wanted to end a conversation quickly and said, No, I don't. That was a mistake. Perfect timing. We're about to have a mixer and one of the guys just canceled. We're in a bit of a bind. I'm not going. I quickly refused before Kevin could continue. However, Kevin was not one to give up easily. Please, man, you can sit there. And of course, since it's last minute, I'll treat you. He was persistent, almost as if he'd follow me home if I refused. Honestly, I often go to drinking parties for work, and I'm not as averse to interacting with others as I used to be. Since he was offering to treat me, I thought, well, if he's going this far, maybe it's okay. Maybe I also harbored a bit of longing for the idea of going out drinking with friends. So I found myself agreeing to this invitation. Not knowing I'd regret it later. Led by Kevin, we met up with another flashy guy at the station. This is Jack, a classmate from middle school. When Kevin introduced me, the other guy chuckled a bit which caught my attention. Nice to meet you. Thanks for coming today. But he quickly said that, so I soon forgot about it. We headed to the Italian bar, the venue for the mixer. 
I had only been to regular pubs when going out with my colleagues. This stylish place was exciting for me. Trying to hide my excitement and maintain a serious face, the women soon arrived. A flashy girl with blonde short hair, a girl with long curly brown hair, and a quiet looking girl with glasses and black hair. The girl with glasses sat opposite me and the mixer began. At first, we did introductions and had harmless conversations, but as the alcohol started to take effect, I began to feel uneasy about Kevin's behavior. Just drank a bit too much, I'm full already. One of the girls said as the drinking party was nearing its end. It's all right, it's all right. Jack here will eat it all up. What, I'm full too. That's what I thought, but then Kevin said. Because this guy grew up really poor, you know. His mom worked at a nightclub, so he's always hungry for food, right? I couldn't find it in me to smile at Kevin's cheery inquiry. Yeah, it's true. But would you say that in front of people you've just met, in claiming I'm starving for food? Something dull seemed to stab at my heart, but I couldn't afford to dwell on it with the atmosphere turning sour. I just endured and ate the food passed to me. I felt miserably humiliated for the first time in a long while. And get this, he was so poor and friendless, that's why I was the only one who befriended him. I'm a nice guy, right? I never asked to be his friend, not even once. But it's true that Kevin's interactions, apart from the bullying, offered some solace back then. However, it turns out, after more than five years, this was his real intention. He was only good at studying but couldn't afford high school because of being poor, so pitiful, right? I invited him today to let him feel a bit of fun, as there's no bright future for a middle school grad. Meanwhile, the leftover, messed up dishes kept being piled in front of me. Why did I even come here? Am I just a laughing stock, a leftover disposal? I was embarrassed about feeling excited about this evening. And there was this super cute girl Maria in our class, but he mistook her talking to him as her liking him. It was so cringy. He's making stuff up. Enough already. I felt pathetic for only being able to think this and not being able to verbalize it. I'd continue to live, being looked down upon by those above me. I thought I had changed for the better after getting a job with a middle school diploma, but it wasn't true. I was just turning a blind eye to the harsh reality. As I felt my world going dark and looked down. That's cold. I heard splash and the girl's screams. Shocked, I looked up to see the girl with glasses standing up and splashing the contents of her glass on Kevin. All this while, you've been talking, but none of it's been funny. And that Maria girl probably liked Jack much more than someone who can understand other people's pain like you. At first, I didn't understand what she had said or done. But slowly, I realized she was standing up for me. Kevin, initially stunned, angrily said, uh, your words mean nothing to me, plain Jane. What do you think you're doing anyway? The girl with glasses, ignoring him, grabbed my bag and said, Let's go, Jack. Hey, wait. I followed her, led away from the restaurant by the girl. Kevin was still saying something, but the girl didn't flinch. Honestly, I was relieved and felt refreshed. If I had stayed there any longer, I might have broken down in tears, despite my age. My past and future seemed too bleak. Uh, thank you, I managed to say as we walked out into the bustling street and stopped by a quieter riverside. It's okay, I was just fed up. If I overstepped, I'm sorry, she said. She turned back to hand me my bag. Wait, was she speaking informally just now? Puzzled, I took a good look at her face for the first time. With glasses on and her bangs covering most of her face earlier, it was hard to see. Under the street light, her long bangs fluttered, revealing a face I recognized. I might not have noticed under normal circumstances. But having just heard about her, I recognized her immediately. Maria, 
She had matured a bit, but her dignified, delicate features were unchanged. Yeah, long time no see, she said, with the same easygoing manner she had in middle school. Turns out, she was asked by her university friends to attend a mixer but didn't want to seriously meet any guys. So she disguised herself to look less appealing to men. Kevin probably never dreamed that the girl was actually Maria herself. But still, even after five years, I had managed to cause Maria concern again. Back then, her greetings were just her way of caring for a lonely me, something I can clearly understand now. Sorry for troubling you, well then. I said that and was about to leave her presence. But then, why are you apologizing? You haven't done anything wrong, Jack. Maria said that. Her words were as straightforward as they had always been. Living straight and true, she could say such things without hesitation. Meanwhile, I feel as if everything I do is an apology in itself. Why? Because I'm pitiable, right? You are caring out of sympathy. It's kind of you, but I'm okay. I've always been like this. I'll continue to live a life where I'm looked down upon by those above me and just endure it. I've accepted that, and I don't want to be helped. It might feel awkward for you, but it's a waste of time for someone like you to worry about me. I don't know why. Why did I say that, even though I was happy she helped me? Maybe because Maria's straightforwardness and radiance made me feel my own inadequacy. I wished I could disappear after saying such things to the very person who had just helped me. But Maria didn't get angry or retaliate. I'm not doing this out of pity. What I said to Kevin and my actions in middle school were all because I wanted to. I'm not doing anything reluctantly. She communicated this with her straightforward words. She wasn't acting out of obligation, but rather following her own feelings. Another heart-touching statement for me. Not knowing how to respond, I remained silent. Don't think of yourself as pitiable. Don't decide your future is doomed. Sure, you've faced a lot of hardships, but you've overcome them. That makes you amazing, Jack. You worked hard in your studies and did chores to make your mom happy. Anyone who tries hard for others is kinder and stronger than anyone else. Her words seemed to gently thaw a frozen part of my heart that had been cold since childhood. Maybe I had always longed to hear someone say you did well or that's amazing, especially since losing my mom. I never expected Maria to say such things. Tears began to flow from my eyes, as if a string had been cut. I ended up crying because of Maria, despite having managed not to cry earlier thanks to her. Maria potted my back until I stopped crying. After that, Maria and I started meeting and talking more often. My first friend, as I never really had friends before. Being with her, I naturally began to relax and smile more. About three months into our relationship, I asked her something that had been bothering me. By the way, did I ever tell you about what I did for my mom? Maria would have been a stranger when my mom passed away in middle school. I didn't remember sharing such personal details with anyone then. Actually, my mom was a senior of your mom. She often talked about her, and since elementary school, I always wanted to meet you. I heard you were a kind boy who cared a lot about his mom. That was news to me. Sorry for turning out to be such a gloomy and dull guy, despite your expectations. I said a bit self-deprecatingly, but Maria's response was unexpected. No, I thought you were exactly the kind person I expected. I saw you early in the mornings in middle school, watering the classroom plants. I used to come early for my class duty. I was surprised she remembered such details. Well, I was the plant caretaker. There were two other caretakers, right, but you were the only one who consistently came early even when no one was watching or had to tell you. That's why I've liked you for a long time. Her words were something I never expected. Really, as I stood there, surprised and at a loss for words, Maria continued. Didn't you notice, even at the mixer, I said those things to stand up to Kevin, but I really meant it. 
I was so nervous saying it, but you didn't react, so I thought maybe you didn't hear me. The girl named Maria would have liked Jack more than you who can understand someone's pain. Indeed, Maria had said that, but I had taken it as just a turn of phrase. It didn't take long for us to start dating after that. The future I once thought was hopeless turned out to be incredibly bright, spending it with someone who made me love myself, warm and radiant like the sun. And today, two years later, we get married. I, who had nearly given up on my life, can't say something cool like the future opens up if you don't give up. But now, with the happiness before me, I've learned to cherish it and to have hope for the future. Together with my wife, who stands by my side, 